everybody. Thanks for coming along. Uh, I'm Amanda Clark. I'm an advanced accredited practicing dietitian, and I'm the author and creator of the Portion Perfection Tools. There's a set for weight control and one specifically for bariatric surgery. I've been working in weight management for over 30 years and bariatric surgery specifically for over 20 years. This session is part of the Portion Perfection Professional Series, where we talk to experts in the field of weight management to help support you from all angles. This evening, my special guest is Dr. Candice Silverman. Candice is Australia's leading robotic surgeon, and I'm proud to say that she is the primary surgeon that I work with. Welcome, Candice. Thank you, Amanda. I'm very proud to be working with you too. So thanks for having me tonight. Oh, thank you. Uh, Candice, can I ask you, what is robotic surgery, if you could let everybody know? Well, um, first you have um, keel surgery. So that's um, surgery done through small incisions. And now imagine um, you put um, instruments through those small incisions. Um, you sit remotely from the patient um, and then you're able to control instruments. And I put my little hand here with all these different degrees of freedom. Um, meantime, you're, you're sitting um, uh, down and you've got 3D vision um, and you can use um, different interfaces um, to get more information about the patient. Um, but ultimately, it's to provide surgery in a more precise way um, and to have me as a surgeon, um, particularly when operating on large people, imagine there are certain um, ergonomic benefits to it. Yeah. Okay. And what actually led you to bariatric surgery in your surgical career? Well, this was, it was by accident. Um, during um, training, um, I didn't have I had very little exposure to metabolic surgery. In fact, um, when I got my fellowship, I thought I was going to either do cancer surgery or trauma surgery. Um, and uh, by, by luck, I did um, a fellowship um, with a very talented, minimally invasive surgeon, got to see great outcomes from patients that did so well. Um, and, you know, if I compare it to my, um, I mean, I do pancreatic surgery as well. Um, which is um, challenging surgery in, in wonderful patients, um, but I sort of felt um, that I could make a greater difference um, really um, by um, offering um, surgery um, to people of size. Yeah, and I think you made an um, interesting correction there that you called it metabolic surgery. Um, why is it called metabolic surgery now? Well, I don't quite know exactly what to call it because... Um, uh, is it surgery for obesity, uh, weight loss surgery? Um, the title that you gave me today was um, bariatric surgery. And, you know, the Greek for baros is uh, pain, burden, suffering. Um, oh. So, yeah, just, just I mean, where does that come from? Um, uh, but so um, in regard to metabolic surgery, I think it's it's a lot more correct. I mean, we, we are correcting metabolic defects. Um we're helping patients with diabetes, high cholesterol, metabolic syndrome. Um, so I think it, it can be looked at, at in um, a different light. Um, and, you know, if we talk, um, and I'm going to go through the updated IFSO guidelines in the presentation, uh, but for those that don't know, IFSO is, is our International Federation for Surgery for Obesity. Um, and, and that they want to call it obesity and metabolic surgery. And even our um, Australian um, organisation has um, added the word uh, metabolic obesity surgery into our title. So I think it's a very important distinction. Yeah. Now, I know that you've got some slides. So um, I will say I've got a whole lot of questions for you. And people have really um, jumped at the chance to actually ask a surgeon some questions um, directly, because I think often when you go to see your own surgeon, you know, you've, you've, you're only getting that, that one lot of answers. And sometimes you're not in control of the, of the consultation or the conversation. There's things to be done. There's questions to be answered and it's easy to forget some of the questions that you had on your mind. So, um, so I've got a nice long list, but let's hand over to you to go through um, your presentation. Cause I think it kind of sets the stage 
and introduces people to some of the things that we talk about at the conferences and yes. guides how we make decisions. And I just want to speak to Amanda, um, uh, in terms of me giving a didactic lecture, please feel free to um, interrupt and question or quiz or if anything you think needs highlighting or um, explaining further, let me know. Um, Great, I love to do that. <laughs> Oh, I'm getting... um, Amanda has introduced me, but I'm a general surgeon. Um, so in my view, I look after the whole of the body. That's what general surgery is. But I do specialize in upper gastrointestinal surgery, bariatric surgery, and well, actually hernia surgery. Um, I work on the border, uh, New South Wales, Queensland. I've uh, got some disclosures. Um, I do education and proctoring for some uh, companies. So these were some of the questions that um, Amanda threw at me as by way of introduction. So I, I hope um, that I can answer those. Um, firstly, I would like to start um, with this comment. Um, so everyone's got a different narrative um, about obesity, and I think it's important and I know you all understand that it's um, it's not about willpower, it's not about determination, it's not about trying harder. Um, it's really, um, to me, my narrative for obesity is that um, it's a chronic disease that is largely genetically um, determined. Um, and uh, what, what I mean by that um, is um, people in their life at different points um, will have their own metabolic set point, um, which is the body's way of keeping things level. Say the word homeostasis, if anyone knows it, um, is relevant here and that pertains to the amount of fat that is stored in the body. Um, so if you consider this a metabolic set point, what happens is that people can lose weight and I know you can all lose weight but the challenge is really is that weight loss maintenance because what happens, you lose the weight um, and then appetite uh, increases, uh, metabolism decreases, even subconscious movement decreases so your body can get you up to that original homeostasis. So that's what I mean um, by the metabolic set point. And, and we alter that through surgery. Um, and then a, a little clarification of what is body mass index. Um, and... Uh, this um, is a way of stratifying um, a, a beast state. Um, it, it's very inexact, very imprecise, but it actually is the best we have. And that's also from these ISO guidelines. Um, but I mean, for normal, I mean, what, what is normal? And I put a query over the normal BMI 20 to 25 with the crew and overweight 25 to 30. So just as a recognition, 60% of Australians are within that BMI group, um, normal, overweight, or even class one obesity. Um, and Amanda, do you want to guess the BMI of Arnold Schwarzenegger? Ah, well, it's going to be pretty high because his weight's high and BMI is really just related to weight. So let me say he's going to be a BMI of 40. What is it? Oh, he? well, not quite as high as that. Um, he's got a okay. BMI of 32. Um, and I was in the Navy and we had clearance divers that would have been considered, you know, in the obese cat category. So, yes, um, actually, I've had lots of people going into the military and, you know, trying to trying to get me to... Um, help them get in because their BMI doesn't meet the criteria. And interestingly, nothing I could do to prove that their body fat was low made any difference. The, well, I'm, the I'm in the military, so hopefully that's changing. Um, that yeah. there's some more information in regard to that the best way if we had it would be to put any everyone into one of these DEXA scans, which is a full body scan, which could um, say what percentage of fat you have. But yeah. we have BMI, it's convenient, and we just need to, to work around it. But the words morbid obesity is, you know, BMI over 40 kilograms per meter square. I think the other thing interesting about BMI is, and I don't know when it changed, but when I went to uni, uh, the ideal, I'll call it not normal, BMI was 20 to 25. But at some point on the way through since then, maybe in the first 10 years after that, um, 
normal or ideal BMI changed to 18.5 to 25. And I can't even find who changed it or why they changed it. When yeah. the whole population was moving heavier, for some reason, we moved the goalpost even lower. Yeah, I th I, it's it's a crazy number, and I, and we shouldn't really be chasing it. Um, but I, it it can be helpful, um, to stratify. So I think it just needs to be um acknowledged um with with a little bit of caution. Yeah. Okay, I'm not going to bore everyone with medical studies, but I'm just going to go through one. And this was like a landmark study, just to give that understanding um about obesity being a jet genetic or um, disorder with a metabolic set point. It well describes it, but the Swedish obese study is done over 20 years ago. It was done in Sweden. Um, no one moves in Sweden. They're all data tracked, um, very intelligent nation. Um, from this study, they had 2000 um, people in each group. So 2000 people that were morbidly obese, so BMI 40, had the best ever diet and exercise program. And then you had 2,000 people that were put through surgery. And these people were, were, were followed over 20 years. Um, and as, as you can see, um, so the top line, the blue line is the control group. So that's the best diet and exercise program. Their, their body weight didn't shift all that. I mean, they didn't go up, but, you know, they didn't shift all that much. And then you can see at the time some historical operation, vertical gastric or gastric stapling and the lap band, did pretty well um, in comparison to the control group. And gastric bypass, which is an operation that's been around for a long time, did, did very well. Um, but what, what is important to note about those curves is that for, for all of the, the operations, the weight loss comes down for the first one to two years. And then there's plateauing with a little bit of weight regain, as you can see from those curves. And that weight regain is the body forming um, their new metabolic set point after surgery. Mm -hmm. What was very important in this study, and it's still relevant today, that if you are morbidly obese um, of an age range, and we can discuss that, I can put my hand on my heart and say, you'd be better off having surgery than no surgery, i.e. you're more likely to die from a heart attack down the track, morbidly obese than you are if you have an operation um, acknowledging um, there are potential risks from surgery. So that's that was an important uh, landmark trial. Um, and I'm very proud of Professor Lillian Cow. She's um, a very prominent obesity surgery in, uh, in Adelaide, and she's also um, the president of the International Federation for Surgery of Obesity. And they've finally updated their guidelines. The old guidelines that we worked with um, we're from 1991. So this is hot off the press, um, but in terms of uh, having extended indications for those that would be appropriate um, for a permanent weight loss procedure, um, it's now BMI over 35, uh, BMI 30 to 35 with heart, you know, comorbidities from um, obesity. And, and there's probably about 20 of them that I could list off the hand. They had a look at different um, age groups too. Um, so for over 70, um, if you're not frail, i.e. if you're a really good 70-year-old and you're playing golf but your knees are sore and you're morbidly obese and you want a better quality of life, then a permanent weight loss procedure um, uh, can give you that. Um, it's also Surgery is also a benefit to adolescents if they're morbidly obese. Um, but you do need a particularly particular allied health team to look after that um, challenging group. And a permanent weight loss procedure, again, um, is very effective as a bridge to therapy. So if your BMI is over 40 and you're booked in for a knee replacement, for example, just hold off, say, look, I should get a, a weight loss operation first, wait 18 months, and then... Um, see if I need that knee, knee replacement at all. Um, ventral hernia, so that means um, abdominal wall hernia. And if I can point to, so ventral is here, um, so that their ventral hernia repairs um, and it, surgery can also be used as a bridge, um, obesity surgery can use a bridge, as a bridge to transplant. Um, it used to be if you're morbidly obese and got kidney failure, you can't get a transplant because um, surgery is too difficult, um, but that's, uh, there's now a pathway for that. 
And just this a little list of who should not have surgery. Um, so um, any drug dependency, uh, smokers, and look, this is my thing. Um, it's also from some other clinics. Um, you might get lucky if you're in um, the, like Italy, for example, would still operate on smokers just because um, most of the population smokes in Europe. Um, but smoke, for me, smoking is a greater risk to your health than the obese state. It's something that you can modify. Um, and also smokers have a higher risk um, of complications from surgery. So for me, you need to be a non-smoker for three months and, and our clinic at least or GP has got a way to, to help with that. Um, not for surgery if you're pregnant or planning pregnancy in the last 12, in the next 12 months um, from surgery. I've put in there untreated. Now that, that's the big word, untreated eating disorders. So I think it's it's fair to say that um, we don't discriminate against those with mental health disease, um, but that needs to be treated and managed in and around surgery. Um, and the ability to comply, which, um, you know, it, there is a regime to get through surgery safely. Um, so uh, that would be a, a requirement. So we've got... Um, uh, what I call my peak program that involves me, um, Amanda Clark's team at Great, Great, Great Ideas, um, psychologist, um, we've got a physician, sometimes we need the help of specialists, um, the anaesthetists I, I use are very talented um, in looking after um, this group of people and you need a hospital that's used to doing hot, hot, high volume of these um, operations because the, the more you do this, the, the safer you can do them. Um, and within this program, um, really uh, the patient's GP is um, central. So what happens? Um, they come in to see me. I get a, a GP referral. You've got your weight, height, uh, appropriate hip and waist circumference. I take a history. We talk about um, past medical history, what's appropriate. I give them some homework and when what I mean by that, the patient, you, you need to understand your operation um, to be able to get the best out of it. So we've got some literature, I've made some YouTube videos, um, uh, make sure we got referrals to see a dietitian and a psychologist. The psychologist is really about behaviour and it's also about checking in with someone if you have tr troubles down the track. Um, endoscopy or gastroscopy, that's um, a flexible scope a camera look at your esophagus and stomach. Um, that's now considered a requirement to do before any weight loss surgery. So we can see what the esophagus looks like, assess if there's what's called a hiatus hernia, have a look at the stomach. Sometimes we refer patients not for surgery, but for medications, which are becoming a bigger part um, of uh, obesity medicine uh, called bariatric physicians. Um, and I make sure everyone has like a nutritional screen. You can see that the blood tests that will go to the Great Ideas and Nutrition Dietitian um, and also the patient's general practitioner. And then we decide what operation. So that was um, one of the questions, which, which operation am I appropriate for? So um, I'll give a little summary. Um, most patients would have the sleeve gastrectomy. That's a, the operation that 80% of Australians uh, would have. Um, and that's for its relative uh, simplicity and its effectiveness. Um, the, the laparoscopic adjustable gastric band, I just do need to mention it because it's had such an um, important place in um, the history of bariatric surgery within Australia, and if not the world but really um, hardly any bands are putting in. And it's more the legacy of looking after patients that have had a previous gastric band, uh, which is sort of an area I, I, I specialize in. So, um, and then you've got various bypass operations. And I've just mentioned two, um, one's called the Roux and Y gastric bypass, uh, which is a traditional bypass operation. It's the one that's been around for the longest, the one that has been studied for the longest. And as you can see um, from the picture, um, can you see why it's called a Y? Can everyone see where the Y is in that picture? But in, in, in essence, at the top of it, if you can understand, there's a gastric pouch. And that gastric pouch is separated from the rest of the stomach and connected to a limb of small bowel that has previously been divided. 
and then reattach to the first part of the small bowel that um, contains bile and pancreatic juice. So that provides a why. Um, it's considered a very good anti-reflux operation, a good weight loss operation, and can also be used for people that have had issues with poor gastric function or gastric emptying. Can I ask um, something about that, Candice? Yeah, go for it. So people might be interested to understand why the rest of the stomach is kept there and why the why? Why not just come from that small stomach further down your intestine? Yeah, so um, the, the remnant stomach um, is left there because you don't always need to resect it. It, it would just make for a larger operation. Um, another reason, and in theory, that rear wide gastric bypass with the remnant and stomach is reversible. And now we just talked about obesity being a chronic disease and needing something permanent for it. But in, in very rare cases, and we're talking maybe one in a thousand rear wide gastric bypasses, it actually works too well um, and patients' blood sugars might be low. So that's a very rare condition that might um, require a reversal but also an advantage that you've still got that stomach tissue so it just stays there happily empty. yeah yeah, yeah. You, 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 you don't really need to to remove it um I mean there are some raring indications of I've mentioned one um is someone has issues with ulcers and you want to remove acid making part of the stomach then that might be another indication but um, it, it, you don't need to complicate things. You can just make a pouch and then connect it to small bowel. So that's why you have the remnant stomach. Mm -hmm. but it, 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 also, that, that part of the stomach can't be accessed endoscopically again. So this is a little bit getting a little bit technical, which is why we like to have a look first with the gastroscopy just to make sure that's all normal. Mm -hmm. um, the, the other type of operation, and I think they've got the term mini gastric bypass here. It goes by many other names. It can be called an omega limb gastric bypass because it forms a little omega limb, or it can sometimes is called a one anastomosis gastric bypass. Mm -hmm. So um, what, 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 what happens here, um, just this part of the, the small bowel receives bile and pancreatic juice, and then that's anastomosed um, to the gastric pouch and that comes around, around the corner. So if I go advantages, one anastomosis gastric bypass, which I think is a better term for it than the Ruai gastric bypass, one of the advantages is that there is just one anastomosis, so it's easier to do. And if you have a rule, the more complex things are, the more complications there are. So that would apply to most things, which would include surgery. The, the downside of the one anastomosis gastric bypass is that bile on occasion can actually come up into the stomach and, and bile reflux can be quite disabling for a small group of people. So if someone has already got issues um, with reflux, really, that's where the Ruai gastric bypass is advantageous. So if I can explain within the stomach as well, most of the acid is made during the lower part of the stomach. So with the root wide gastric bypass, it comes around the corner. And then this limb, this one that goes up to anastomose to the gastric pouch, that's called the alimentary limb or where the food goes. That's considered to be almost a dry pouch, i.e. there's no acid, no bile, food just goes directly from your mouth into this limb of small bowel to be connected to um, where the bile comes down, lower down. So um, th there are pros and cons of both of the, the, those operations. The one anastomosis gastric bypass to, to prevent that bile coming up, um, This the length of this limb um, of the small bowel limb is, is a lot longer than you need for the Ruai gastric bypass, which, which makes it more metabolic. Um, and I, there's a thing that the, the more weight loss, the more metabolic an operation, the higher chance of malnutrition and osteoporosis and losing muscle mass. Mm -hmm. So it, 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 look, it, it, it is a balance. If, if we had these operations that would take every 150 kilogram patient and get them down to 60 kilos, so if, that, if that's your average on your bell curve, then you'd have 
half of the population with malnutrition and mm. issues with, you know, liver cirrhosis, um, you, you know, the consequences. Um, I've, with the railway gastric bypass sleeve pathway, I mean, I've operated on maybe two and a half, 3,000 patients. I think I've had maybe two that we've really had to work, re and you you would know their names, Amanda, that we'd really have to work hard to, to, to make sure they're well. So whilst I know a patient as an individual might want to get down to an ideal body weight, we've got to think of the whole group of patients that we operate and we have to offer surgery in a safe way. So we can just be grateful um, you know, that someone's 30, 40 kilos down and not necessarily, you know, getting into their skinny genes. So that that's part, part, part of the balance um, of weight loss surgery. And I ho ho hope I've explained that um, in a different way today. Yeah, I think that's really good. And, you know, I, I was mentioning to you that that was my question for you to point out that, um, you know, I said, what's mini about the mini gastric bypass? Mm. And so you've said, well, there's just one kind of... Um, connection you're not actually um, chopping off the intestine and bringing it up you're um, you're just bringing up the intestine and joining it and um, because I do have people sometimes saying oh maybe I'll just go for the mini gastric bypass you know meaning it's a little one um, there won't be too much malabsorption but in fact there's more malabsorption and so these are the ones that um, that I find more more problems on their blood tests um, uh, yeah, it's interesting. So, I mean, also when I talk about these gastric band patients, um, so if you've got, oh, hang on, I've done something funny there. <laughs> uh, try again. I'll try again. I'll, yeah, just go yeah. down, down. down. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Um, so um, when you revise them to another weight loss operation, you want to do a safe operation. Um, one of the advantages of the Ruai gastric bypass, it's a safe revisional operation after a failed gastric band. And that's to demonstrate if you have a leak or a complication around the gastric pouch where it's anastomosed to this limb, a small bowel, it's a dry limb, so it doesn't leak a lot. You might have a little bit of contamination, but it's it's quite easy to rescue um, as opposed to the so-called mini or the one anastomosis gastric bypass. If you do get a leak in, in this region, it's more likely to leak out bile juice, which can be um, in some cases life-threatening. So not that these happen often, thank God, um, but yeah, they're just uh, something as, as a surgeon, um, you want to know how well your operations fail if they do so yeah. um just one so I, I, I hope that, that, that that's explained it something i just thought i'd point out is that with the sleeve you've got your natural sphincter or muscle at the top of the stomach and at the bottom but with both of those bypasses you've got the top one but you no longer have the bottom one so the bottom one is kind of like a surgical sort of narrowing isn't it yeah. yeah, so um, what's well, interesting, the, the bypass, you get more dumping, if that's what you're referring to. The, the sleeve it, dumping happens on occasion, but less often from those sphincters. Mm. Um, the, the, the sleeve, um, as an operation, it can be more prone to reflux down the track. So that's really a symptom that we um, assess very well pre-surgery and post-surgery as well. So... Most patients will get the sleeve, 80%. If someone's got severe reflux, then the Ruai gastric bypass. If someone, say, has type 2 diabetes or a lot of weight to lose, you might want to consider um, the Ruai or the mini gastric bypass. So that's that's a quick summary of those operations. All right. So then um, after the patients have done their homework, they come back to see me, uh, check all their bloods, go through all the letters, um, make sure that they have an understanding of surgery, um, book a date and once everyone has, has a date for two weeks um, everyone needs to go on the very low calorie diet um, which the dietitians assist with and then they have the operation and it's a keyhole operation walking around straight away five small incisions one or two nights in hospital that is the the normal recovery um, afterwards um, patients go for two weeks on a fluid diet Two weeks on the puree diet, soft solids at the four-week mark. Dietitians help through all those transitions. Uh, patients take medications to help with reflux symptoms for the first month. Um, a multivitamin lifelong. 
the CS intensity for 12 months and then um, for long-term follow-up. So you can't tell the difference from, for me, by looking at them, what type of operation they've mm. had. Um, so they, they all get treated the same way. Yeah, I would say that I can't tell either, even with respect to weight loss. Like I wouldn't say that I noticed that um, bypass achieves any greater weight loss than sleeve amongst our patients. I don't, yes. I don't know how that plays out. Yeah, no, no, and and the literature would, would suggest the same. It, the the weight loss, um, it short short to long term is almost equivalent for those two yeah. populations. Yeah. Okay. Um, so what weight loss to expect? Um, well, that it depends. And um, we talked about you know the operation um, sleeve bypass equivalent also depends on your age. Like a a young person. Um, would um, lose more weight because of the higher metabolic rate than an old person. That's played out in all the studies. Um, if someone's inactive, um, uh, less weight than someone that's active, um, eating behaviours do make a difference um, to an extent. Um, but just an, as an idea, I've had this slide for a while, but I just pulled out my first 500 patients. You can see that most of the weight loss happens in the first 18 months and we've, I've used a different phrase here because it's important to understand a little concept of excess weight loss um, so just say um, just to explain if someone starts at um, 150 kilograms and from insurance tables or a BMI of 25 their ideal weight is 80 kilograms that means their excess weight is 70 kilograms so the expected weight loss would be 70% of 70, which is about 49 kilograms. So you, you, you would see that someone that's 200 kilograms would lose more weight than someone that started at 110 kilograms. But paradoxically, the percentage of their excess weight loss might be higher um, in someone that started at, say, 110 kilograms and then got down to 80 kilograms. They've lost 30 kilograms, if that makes sense. So they've lost 100% of their excess weight, which might be less weight um, than a 200-kilogram patient would lose. So there, there also is a bit, a, a lot of individual variability. Um, so you can't really compare yourself to someone else on social media or the friend next door. You know, everyone's different. So... All, all, all we focus on really as a clinic um, is on eating behaviours. Um, so that's what I mean by behaviours. It's not like, oh, you got to do this, do that, do all the right things. We're just really talking about three meals, three snacks, having a plan, um, touching base with um, the dietitian. So I, I I know and I can speak to Amanda. Oh, oh, actually, I want Amanda to comment on that, really. People that regain the weight and it's, post-surgery and, and I, I can always pick they're either doing one of two things I mean oh. it's very uncommon but for me oh. I know they're doing one of two things I, I would say that too what's your two things what do, what would you say well that's why I wanted to focus on the eating behaviors so like three meals three snacks avoiding grazing so um yes yeah, so with, with with so that's one of them so grazing what we mean by that is I have a little bit to eat stop, have a little bit to eat, stop, have a little bit to eat. And it doesn't matter the size of your gastric pouch. It doesn't matter the size of your sleeve. If you keep on putting a little bit in all the time, particularly nocturnal calories, um, then you might not get the success that you wanted. Um, and my, my second behavior, and I call these liquid calories. So um, that could mean uh, alcohol, chocolate, ice cream, um, liquid calories. So yeah. Okay. So my two would have been grazing. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I take your point about, uh, about easily consumed calories, liquid calories. Um, my second point would have been portion size that okay. stretching or decreasing the sensitivity of that stretch mechanism, that stretch receptor in the stomach um, so that you're no longer feeling satisfied on the kind of one cup that we build people up to. You know, I would say if you never eat more than one cup volume, then you will always feel satisfied by one cup. But as soon as you start eating a bigger volume, even occasionally, you kind of start to decrease that sensitivity and you can get to the point where it takes a cup and a half to, to get that same sensation. So, yeah, okay, we're on the same page. All right, we're on the same page. All right, but I also do want to emphasise that some weight, weight regain is normal. And you can see just the shape of the curve from that Swedish B study curve. So weight loss, a little bit of weight regain, it's normal. Your, your body's now accustomed to the surgery. Um, 
you, you, you've got a new um, metabolic set point um, and you can see sort of long-term success. So um, uh, this might, people go, has the sleeve stretched? Um, there are multiple factors with this. It's not just one. So once you've had, you know, most of the stomach removed, it's never going to go back to its original size. But yes, it does accommodate a little bit. But then in terms of another mechanism of weight loss, which might have been, um, you know, you remove part of the top part of the stomach, which makes a hormone called ghrelin, which controls hunger and appetite. So university patients post sleeve and also the ghrelin effects with the bypass won't have that drive to eat. Now, the body is a little bit fickle. Maybe now this ghrelin is made in different places. So, you know, you do get a, a, a return of appetite. And I, I actually see this as a bit of a safety mechanism because if you had a weight loss operation that your weight just kept on falling and sort of never plateauing out, um, it could lead to some serious um, health consequences. So, um, again, I just think that the focus is on, I guess, normalizing this, um, focusing on eating behaviors, uh, medications can be useful. Um, unfortunately, there's a worldwide shortage of Azempic or GLP-1 agonists or Sexenda, um, something to do with the war in Ukraine or supply chain issues. They're supposed to be coming back online um, in um, early next year. But also from USA, some of these medications that we're injecting are becoming available as oral um, formulations. So just our, this is a really important space, the medications. Um, I can name some others, Contrave, Topamax, Duramine, Zoloda. Um, this, this, this is a, a very, very important space. And, and, you know, whilst you won't get that dramatic weight loss from, from a weight loss operation, it can add in a lot of, in, a, in another 10% of excess weight, which is weight loss, which is often all, all that people need for for a kickstart if they want that as as well. Um, revisional weight loss surgery. Well, for me, someone's failed a gastric band. Um, yes, I think it's not unreasonable to go for for a bypass. Say, um, if someone has reflux after a sleeve gastrectomy, yes, I think again a bypass. Um, some there there might be some benefits say for those that have a ruai gastric bypass and it's not something i've been involved with but making the pouch smaller um, endoscopically um, is well described um, if you're in america they they in europe they might be doing some of these what's called limb lengthening procedures or converting to more metabolic operations with the small bowel work but i, I this is not really the australian uh, practice um, so I'd probably just focus on um, the top four uh, listed there in terms of what to do for, for weight regain. So it, it's it's safe oper operations, as, as mentioned, um, uh, less chance of dying from a weight loss operation than you do of dying from your, your obese state. Um, the, the sleeve, and I'll give you some of the Aussie data, um, very little complications, just reflux down the track, which we need to to, to monitor for. So yeah, we we Australia is very organised, and thanks to Wendy Brown and Monash University, and um, we have a bariatric surgery registry, which will hopefully influence policy down the track. But um, we've got a lot of patients in it. Um, I commit to putting our patients into this registry, and just 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 some interesting things. Um, so it's mainly females, 80% females. And it's not because obesity is more a female disease. It's just more females choose to have obesity surgery, which is interesting. Um, unfortunately, there's an underrepresentation of doing this operation in the public system, which um, we're, we all need to advocate for. Um, and as you can see there, the sleeve gastrectomy makes up um, the vast majority um, of those operations. As, and so um, the complications, so 90 day complications refer to anyone that comes back into hospital for any reason, has a reoperation for any reason, or has the length of stay extended for any reason. And you can see that, that the numbers are quite, quite low. Sleeve is 1.5%. Ruai gastric bypass, well, it's got twice the number of anastomoses than a one anastomosis gastric bypass. So it does have twice the amount of complications. So just a, a, a little idea from uh, the Australian experience. So I hope I've answered your questions.
Yeah, I think you really have. There's a question in the chat, which I think you've answered. Is revision suitable after long-term sleep gastrectomy? I guess that's saying and weight gain. Yeah, I mean, I, I enjoy, enjoy seeing these patients. Um, and often it's a discussion with them. You say, well, you've come back from 140 kilos, you got down to 75 and now you're 90, um, 50 kilos down from your starting weight. Uh, let, let us get you reviewed by the dietitian. Do you want to see a psychologist? I'll do another gastroscopy um, just to assess what your esophagus um, looks like, a consideration for some medications to help get that weight down. If you've got esophageal changes, reflux, hiatus, hernia, then um, I think revising to a gastric bypass is not unreasonable. So, so that, would, that would be my approach to those patients. Yeah, okay. So um, looking at the questions, and there's lots of them, we've got about um, just over 15 minutes le left. So I'll aim to be quick through these. Um, so the first question is, why is there reflux after gastric sleeve? Um, that's, that's a very good question. And, and I'd actually like to understand um, this in, in more detail, um, uh, intending on setting up a physiology lab um, within the rooms in the next um, year or two. But in terms of um, what we, as Amanda says, you have at the bottom of your esophagus a sphincter. So that's called the lower esophageal sphincter. And then a normal stomach, you have got a large volume. And then at the bottom of the stomach, you have another sphincter called a pylorus before you go into your small bowel. So anatomically, we change the shape of the stomach from being a high volume, low pressure system. And now if we make it smaller, if you talk about um, the laws of physics, it becomes now a low volume, high pressure system. Also, we need to, to know the effect of reflux and where the diaphragm is. So if there's any um, undiagnosed or any new hiatus hernia, i.e. part of the stomach is now above the diaphragm where it has its pinch effect on, on reflux, um, that, that can cause reflux to be made worse. And it, it, it really is a phenomenon. There are some patients post sleeve that have very bad reflux that even medications can't control. So um, that in this fine, they probably know who they are. Um, and yeah, of, often that they, they will need assessment to see, well, first we need to know what is reflux? What do you mean by reflux? What are your symptoms from reflux? Uh, is what you describing as reflux really reflux? Or do you, is your esophagus not pushing things down? Are, is your diet needing modification or I mean do you have changes in your esophagus so all, all of these things need to be considered but um, for, for the reasons I said it, it, it really is a phenomenon post-sleeve gastrectomy fortunately it doesn't happen in everyone um, and it, it is something that does need um, active management. Mm. Is it possible to stretch the sleeve stomach by overeating leading to weight regain? Uh, yeah, I sort of um, mentioned everyone gets a new metabolic set point sort of three, four, five years after bariatric surgery, and there's it's, there's multiple mechanisms behind that. Um, but yeah, um, the, the stomach will never get to the same shape as it was originally, but certainly it will accommodate over time. Mm. I actually really wonder whether some people just genetically have a stretchier, have stretchier membranes. You know, some people have stretchier tendons. Maybe some people are more prone to that re-stretching of the stomach, whereas others um, have a, a tighter um, mechanism, which is perhaps yeah. how... There, there, there also is a, is a lot... In in, sorry, Amanda, to interrupt in the, in the technical aspect of it, because you imagine you've got your sleeve that comes down and then it goes around a corner mm -hmm. um, and how much antrum you take at the bottom of the state. So if you imagine like a tube with a kink in it and what happens to that tube over time. So what happens, it, it can dilate above the kink and it can dilate below the kink and then you have a kink in there. So that, that 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 often is the shape of sleeves we see five six seven years down the track so mm -hmm. people can and I, I've just come back from the Sydney Upper GI Surgical Conference and we went through these um, in detail and it's very interesting that the shape that the stomach gets you know five ten twenty years now that we have that sort of data post sleeve so mm -hmm. um, yeah but I, I do I agree with what you're saying in the individual variability of um, tissue compliance and I would agree with that. Yeah, like I was also reading something that indicated that those with a longer intestine generally are at a higher weight. So yeah, maybe 
maybe just some people have more absorptive surface, even even with a bypass, and yes. yeah, we don't get to check all that out. Um, okay. Uh, why do some people never feel hungry post surgery and others do? Yeah, well, I mean, it's it's interesting. I mean, to what, what what's the difference between anorexia and nausea? Um, so these are two medical terms. So anorexia means you don't feel hungry, and nauseous means you feel like you're going to vomit. And um, and then you've got satiation, which is another side of that. So um, they're they're all on the same spectrum. Um, I, I I would pass on that question to my psychologist or dietitian, to be honest, Amanda. What, what, what do you feel about that? Well, there are, there are a number of things that lead to a sensation um, that we might interpret as hunger. And so it may be, maybe there's some of these ghrelin um, uh, cells somewhere else and we're producing more and it is a physiological hunger. Um, maybe there's other things that give us a gnawing feeling in our stomach that we interpret as hunger. So that's where I guess as a team, we try to figure out, you know, what happens when we do certain things? Um, how do we treat you like a self-experiment and explore what this problem is? Mm. So, yeah, probably no clear-cut answer. Um, can drinking large volumes of water after gastric sleeve surgery stretch your sleeve? Um, I, I wouldn't think so. I wouldn't think so. I've got my water bottle with me here, so I'm, I'm hydrating. Um, it, it can be harder to drink, like go like, and this is one of the challenges. I think I'm on the Northern Rivers. It's getting hot doing this operation over Christmas. It can be hard to maintain that hydration during a time if you're sweating outside. So um, uh, we, we do try try to regulate drinking to drink little sip, put it down, drink a little sip, put it down. Um, and certainly that there are, um, uh, well, we try to um, encourage people not to drink um, sort of in and around mealtimes as well for various reasons. Yeah, um, so I'd describe it a bit like a funnel that, you know, if you poured water in too fast, you can make that funnel overflow. But if you're pouring it in gradually, um, it'll just keep going through. And there's no reason for water to sit in your stomach for very long because there's no nutrients in there that need digestion. So usually water moves through pretty quickly. So even when we talk about drinking before and after a meal, I would say once you've kind of recovered and the swelling's gone down, that um, you could probably drink, you know, 10 minutes, five minutes before. Just it, It's just that funnel effect. It just depends how quickly it goes through. But after you've eaten, one of the reasons why we don't want to add liquid is that if you've eaten a cup full of food and then you drink a cup full of liquid, well, then you've got two cups in there. And then we're doing that stretching. You've also got the risk of kind of um, flushing things through by creating that pressure. So, um, yeah, I think that. Hopefully that covers that. What's the average weight gain from point of lowest weight after surgery? And how come you can eat more after about a year or so? I think I've probably just dis discussed that, have I not? Um, uh, so I think, well, average weight loss from, from operation, you're talking about this 70% of excess weight. Um, average weight loss at six months from um, sleeve bypass, it's about 20 kilograms. Um, the people can all eat more generally after one to one year to 18 months after, after weight loss surgery because um, things do accommodate um, a little bit. So honestly, like my, my goal as a surgeon really is that um, patients have normal GI function, i.e. can eat a full textured diet that, that's healthy um, without uh, vol vomiting or reflux. And these are the two questions I ask. So if we, we, we've achieved that, um, then that's the aim. Um, I think um, probably Amanda can talk more, more about the portions there. Yeah, so also, so that average weight gain, uh, so typically, I think the research says that you might regain about 20% of what you lost. Um, and that might come, as you saw from the graph that Candace showed, it's really over the eight years that follow. And then we start to see sort of plateauing. 
um, and yeah, reasons you can eat more is that some of those hormonal effects on those appetite suppressing hormones um, start to wear off and you may start to get some of that, that appetite increasing hormone ghrelin um, starting to pop up in other areas. Um, there's a, a question in the chat about gallbladder. I've read that gallbladder attacks are quite common after weight yes. loss surgery. Why yes. is that? Yeah. So, yeah, um, it's, a, it's a one in four. About one in four patients um, will develop gallstones or problems with their gallbladder after weight loss surgery. Um, and this, this is due primarily to, to rapid weight loss. Um, there's a bit of science and physics in it, but, it, but in essence, um, it can change the constituency of bile such, such that cholesterol crystals um, come out. Um, and it, it's a one in four. It's not everyone um, and probably not a high enough number to take everyone's gallbladder out at the time of surgery. Um, but certainly if, if anyone does have gallstones and symptoms from their gallstones, then um, often you can do the operations together. Mm, okay. There's some good surgical questions in the chat. So I might stay over there. Um, what can be done for people who continue to get some reflux after Ruan Y? Yeah, so so medications. Um, oh, first, I mean, you can assess if they've got a hiatus hernia that might need to be repaired. Um, and then there's medications and the correct use of medication. So we're talking proton pump inhibitors. Um, some are more effective than others. And I've had some good advice from a conference I went to on the weekend. Um, and then there's um, dietary and lifestyle measures. So um, the main ones are keeping your, your, your volumes of your food small um, from avoiding um, eating within three hours um, of lying flat and avoiding things that you probably are already smoking, cigarettes, caffeine, alcohol, chili, citrus. Um, so that's the usual uh, lifestyle um, advice. And, and also, I guess, if you've had reflux post um, bypass, um, you'd need to have an assessment of gastroscopy to see if there's any anatomic um, abnormality that's um, uh, causing that. Okay. Um, is it better to have your operation with a specialist that works exclusively in, exclusively in bariatric surgery rather than a general surgeon with an interest in bariatric surgery? And how can you find out how many operations a surgeon has completed and their outcomes? Well, firstly, um, we all start off as general surgeons. So um, that's that's the pathway through us as a college of surgeons. So, um, and within general surgery, you then specialize in, you know, colorectal, upper GI, et cetera. So um, that's, it's just Australian terminology, um, but, but certainly you don't want someone that's just doing bariatric surgery occasionally. So you could ask how many operations have you done per year? When did you start operating? How many operations has your hospital done? Who's going to look after me when you're away? Um, uh, they, they, these are all very good questions. Um, you could ask about their complication rates. Um, certainly, I, I enjoy answering those questions. Um, honestly, um, yeah, that, that that is a great, great question. Um, in in my my mind, probably you'd be wanting to do um, at least fifty of these operations a year, and that's probably would be um, a, a lower limit um, for me. I'm um, sort of somewhere between 200 and 300 um, uh, these operations a year. Um, there, there are some higher volume surgeons than me um, in Australia. Um, I do enjoy my lifestyle, so that's that's probably a, a, a reflection of that. Um, but yeah, I think that's a great question um, and you should ask it of all your surgeons. Yeah, good, good point. Um, Tracy had a question. Um, she said she's going for gastric bypass in January. Her surgeon has said he would prefer to do a 150 centimetre loop rather than a 100 centimetre loop. Um, possibly the way you've explained um, the surgeries may have answered this, um, but she wanted to understand the advantages of it. She doesn't really understand, uh, but she may now. Yeah, so um, if you're talking about one anastomosis gastric bypass, or it was originally described by a surgeon called Professor Rutledge, and he called it the mini gastric bypass. And the way he described it, um, you count um, from the start of the small bowel two metres before anastomosing it to the gastric pouch. 
Um, and it's a great metabolic operation, but for some people can cause issues with um, malnutrition mm -hmm. from that to 200 centimetres because it depends really how much of the rest of the bowel you have to be able to absorb um, the bile and the food when they come together. So um, by, by shortening that 200 to 150, um, I think those numbers just from the papers does gives you as good as weight loss um, without as much metabolic consequences. Now, doing a 120 centimetre, to me, for that type of configuration does sound a little short because it might predispose you to some bile reflux. So, um, Candice, Tracy's yeah. just commented in the chat that it's a Ruan Y. So ah, perfect. So, okay. All right. Yeah, yeah. So, so well, that they're great numbers then because um, I, I do a 120 centimetre, um, an alimentary limb and a 60 centimetre biliary pancreatic limb um, for my Ruan Y's pretty standardly. So um, it sort of steers me out of trouble in terms of mal malnutrition and you still get, you know, adequate weight loss for that. Um I'm, I'm thinking if you've got type 2 diabetes or yeah. severe on insulin, he might be wanting to make one of those limbs longer. So, um, so which limb would we be talking about there? The 150 or the 100? You talked about the alimentary limb, which is where you've got the stomach coming yeah. straight down. But yeah. there's also the, the rue limb or the bypass. Yeah, I've got a feeling it's going to be talking about the biliary pancreatic limb. Um, the bypass like, honestly, Tracy, there's a lot of debate amongst surgeons. And I can honestly tell you that the operation that the surgeon recommends would be the operation that the surgeon does and likes so you just need to take also what I'm saying maybe with a pinch of salt um but yeah I, I think it'd be important just to understand the operation but I, I I dare say he's he's wanting to make that limb longer because you have severe diabetes I'm just re reading bit, bit between the lines yeah yes okay and last question um how would we be in a situation where food availability was scarce or maybe a, a cancer diagnosis. We've had this surgery, we've got a limited ability to eat, but now we need to eat for survival. Um, how do we manage? Yeah, so, so I mean, this is a, a good question. And often um, I have this discussion with people that sit across um, the desk from, from me and they're, you know, morbidly obese, and I'm not, and I say to them, well, if we're here during a time of fast or famine, you'd be a survivor and I'd be under the ground. So um, it, 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 it is interesting. Um, we're, we're now in an environment where, where food is available. We're not moving that much. We're maybe not sleeping um, as well. And um, uh, there, there, there are a lot of calorie dense options that are very close to us. Um, so... Uh, but at the same time, like how many calories do we really need um, in a day to survive? And um, we've got um, options um, in terms of um, having protein drinks and protein replacement. And certainly I sent some patients um, to Amanda that I say, Amanda, they've had weight loss surgery, but they really need to have their nutrition supplemented. Can you help me on this? And certainly we can work work, work together um, to achieve that. I reassure people that don't worry, I can figure out how to make it happen. All those things that we ask you not to do, like grazing, liquid calories, stretching the pouch, we can do those if we need them. Mm -hmm. 100%. Yep. Hmm. Okay. All right. Well, um, I, I know there was extra questions, but I think we've covered the bulk of them there. Thank you so much for your time, Candice. Really appreciate it. Um, uh, I think you've um, you've really answered most things there. I really appreciate thank your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'll it's see you. Fun. Tomorrow. Appreciate it. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Thanks everyone. All right. Thank you. Good night. Bye. Bye. Bye.